Hello, um, I'd like to start by saying thank you to the organizers of today's event for letting me come up and represent our team who are working on seabirds in Biop. And uh, thank you to all the other speakers for such interesting talks. Um, thanks for raising the bar so high, guys, no pressure. Okay, this is our team, we're quite a small team, um, and we represent a collaboration between ZSL's Institute of Zoology and the University of Exeter. There's five of us at the moment, um, our sixth member is not a seabird, but we will be looking for a new postdoc next year. Um, so why do we want to study seabirds in Biot? Well, the Western Indian Ocean supports 19 million seabirds, and as Nick just so eloquently explained for us. Um, they are an important link between the marine and terrestrial environment, and they can have a direct influence on coral reef ecosystems. Um, they can also be a great indicator of where prey is distributed, so they can give you information about where there might be fish species in the ocean. Um, and Biot is interesting because it is the largest marine protected area within the Western Indian Ocean, and there are 18 different species of breeding seabirds there. Despite this, and the fact that seabirds are brilliant, as we know, um, there is a limited knowledge about their status and ecology within Biot. And with this in mind, our project was set up with three main aims. Firstly, we want to know what seabirds are there, where they are, how many there are, and how their trends in their population numbers have changed over time. Are they increasing, decreasing, or are they fairly stable? We also want to know how breeding seabirds in Biot are using the marine protected area or the area around it during the breeding season for foraging and finding food to provision themselves and their chicks. And the, the third and possibly the most complicated one of our aims is to look at non-breeding seabirds and how they are um, using the area within their MPA or outside it, and also how seabirds from the wider Western Indian Ocean might be using the MPA. Um, so, in order to address this, our first aim, the status and distribution of the birds, um, we are planning to collate huge amounts of data from historical surveys of the islands and combine these with census data that we've been collecting recently. Um, and then finally, we want to create new monitoring protocols so that this can be continued into the future. How are we doing? Um, well, Pete Carr, who Nick was mentioning, is part of our team, and a big part of his PhD project is going to be using the data that he's collated, which is over 50 years of bird trends, um, to look at how terrestrial important bird areas in Biot are um, representing, how well they're representing where the birds actually are. Um, and this data that he's collected and put together is also already being used by BirdLife International in their continuing reassessment of marine important bird areas in the region. And finally, we've been using it already to refine when we go out into the field so that we can really capture peak breeding season when we're going out and finding the birds. Our second aim, to look at how the birds are using the MPA during the breeding season, to address this, we've mostly been doing tagging and tracking. And we've been using two different kinds of tags. The first one is a GPS tag, which mostly gives us location behavior. And the second one is a GLS tag, which has a temperature sensor and a wet and dry sensor. So that can give us activity data about where the birds are foraging and what they're doing. Um, and we have a stand, actually, so if you want to see any of these tags, come and see me in the break. You can have a look at them. They're so light. They're, they're pretty cool. Um, the second part of this is um, that, well, bio is subject to two different monsoon periods, and breeding occurs throughout both of these periods. So we want to make sure that we capture what the animals are doing during both of these periods. So we go out during both the southeast monsoon and the northwest monsoon. And because it's such a huge area, there are colonies of birds spread out throughout the archipelago, and we want to make sure that we can go and represent 
um, the birds in all of these areas. So we want to go to multiple study locations. For the same reason, we want to look at different species because they may be going to different areas within the MPA. That might vary species to species. So we want to try and look into that. And finally, to account for uh, interannual variation, changes in environmental conditions, or changes in prey distribution, we want to repeat this sampling over multiple years. So far we had a, kind of like a pilot study in 2016, and then we did our first year in earnest this year. Progress. So we've, our main study site so far has been on Diego Garcia, and we've managed to get almost 150 tag combos out, so that's the GPS and GLS together. And we've had a recovery rate of about 80%, which we're really happy with. Um, so a lot of the birds are coming back full of data. Um, so we've been out in four seasons across the two years and the four monsoon periods. And we've also been able to involve some of the military forces from um, Diego Garcia, which has been great. It's been really fun having them along, and we think that they've enjoyed it too, so that's been great for the project. So I just want to talk you through some of what we found. Together, we've got about 300 tracks from our data from Diego Garcia, um, and these are just a subsample. So if the northwest monsoon here on the left, um, you can see red and yellow, and that represents what we think might be two different foraging strategies, going further out to sea for longer periods of time and then doing these short trips in yellow. So yeah, the red ones are the ones. And then what you can see with the different monsoon periods is that the tracks seem to be more directional during this second southeast monsoon um, and less variable. And we suspect that this might be because of the strong um, southeast trade winds affecting where the birds are flying. Um, the final thing to note is the black line is the bounds of the MPA. And all of our birds so far have remained within the bounds of the MPA, except for this one bird, but, <laughs> this bad bird, that, but that year it was an exception. That bird's nest was actually destroyed by a storm, so it, what's a polite way to say it? It left, and, but, and then came back. <laughs> um, so this year we were able to go to the first of our new locations, Nelson's Island, which is um, more northern than uh, Diego Garcia. Um, and we were able to tag more red-footed boobies, again with the GLS GPS combinations, as well as starting to tag a new species for us, the brown booby. Um, we had a good recovery rate of tags, about 95% for the redfoots. And the boobies, although it was a small sample, we were just trialing our methods. We managed to get all our tags back, which was really exciting. Um, just for comparison, redfoots, browns. The browns are a bit bigger. They're ground nesting. The redfoots nest up in the trees. So these are some of our tracks. Again, it's just a subsample. Um, I realized recently, I'm very sorry if anyone's red, but red, green, color blind. You're just gonna have to trust me on these. This is two different, um, this is multiple different birds in the red and green. Um, so the red foots we can see cover bigger distances than the brown boobies, which seem to be staying inshore in shallower waters. Um, although the trip durations are pretty similar, the redfoots are covering bigger distances, which we weren't expecting, um, and we found quite interesting. And then this is just a comparison again. During the same period of the year, we have the Diego Garcia birds and the Nelson's Island birds, and these are both the red-footed boobies. So this is the same species in different colonies, and what we weren't expecting to see, and what's really interesting, is that the redfoots from Diego Garcia are covering much bigger distances. So they're completely spatially separated. They're going to different areas, which is interesting in itself, but there's also a behavioral difference. The redfoots are going out for multiple day trips, whereas the, red, the redfoots in Diego Garcia, sorry, whereas the redfoots in Nelson's are doing these short day trips. So not only is there spatial segregation in where they're going, there's also behavioral differences. And that's why it's so important for us to go to multiple colonies and 
uh, tag different birds. Our, our final aim is to tag birds so that we can see what they're doing outside of the breeding period. And this means tagging them with long-term recording devices um, so that we can get these back later and find out what they're doing when they're not tied to the nest. Um, we also want to incorporate track data from other species and from birds that are not breeding in biop but may be using the MPA. So how are we doing with that? Well, we've deployed over 100 long-term devices. So far, we haven't got many back because most of them went out this year, so they'll be out and we'll be collecting them next year, hopefully, um, and looking into where the birds have been going. Um, we've also established access to data from, some, from one of our collaborators, uh, Mathieu Lacour is here, and we're really grateful that he could, hello. <laughs> we were grateful that he could come out, um, and he is going to help us with looking at track data from other areas of the Western Indian Ocean. Um, he also heads the Indian Ocean Seabird Group, and we've put out a call for collaborators there. Anyone else with track data who would like to get involved in looking at the wider Indian Ocean movements of seabirds. Um, it is worth pointing out that we've also refined our bird painting technique. Um, <laughs> I was slightly over-enthusiastic that season. And it does wash off, honestly. <laughs> Um, future plans. So Pete, as a big part of his PhD, is now going to be using all that long-term data and new data that he's been amalgamating to look at how maybe different factors such as uh, invasive species presence, the disturbance by humans in the past, or um, island size and vegetation cover might be, a, might be affecting and might have affected um, bird numbers and distribution. Um, we're also going to be looking at alternative methods for monitoring seabirds on islands where we're not present, so doing things like leaving camera traps out or acoustic devices to record seabird presence um, and detect different species. Um, also, the rats on Diego Garcia aren't this cute, in case anyone's seen them. Um, our second aim, we're going to be going out again this year to do, a, I mean, next year to repeat what we've been doing and collect more data. We're also hoping that we can extend our study region. So this is Diego Garcia at the bottom, our initial study site. Then we have Nelson's Island, the one that we've just come back from. And then in the future, we're really hoping to get out to Danger Island in the western side of the archipelago. Um, in 2016, Pete and Malk were able to opportunistically tag a booby, a red-footed booby, up in Perospanos, up here. And that bird went out west, which none of our other birds have done. So it shows possibly more um, behavioral differences and spatial differences in where the birds are foraging. So it would be really great to go and go to a colony in the west and see what those birds are doing. Um, we also want to try and look at some of the tracking data in a finer scale so that we can really pinpoint when foraging events are occurring. And we can do this by things like accelerometry tags or possibly even camera tags in the future. It's something that we're looking into. And that would be great because then we can really define where the birds are foraging, um, which is important for conserving um, the area and species that they're foraging on. Um, so, for non-breeding seabirds, hopefully we'll be getting all those tags back that we already put out and seeing where those birds went. Um, and we'll be using some of that data that Matthew and hopefully some other people will be donating to us. Um, and hopefully we can get a spread from across the Western Indian Ocean of different seabirds in this area, where they're moving, whether they're coming to buy it, whether they're traveling through it. Thank you. I'd like to sorry. <laughs> so I'd like to thank um, Biota, um, the British forces, because they do give us a lot of support when we're out there. Um, the crew of the Grampian Frontier, especially the SFPO, who's been helping us with protocols, um, and of course our funders, the Bertarellis. Thank you so much. <laughs>